going to talk about back focus. Google the term and you'll get many different definitions of the term back focus, and they don't agree with each other. Now, I'm no Webster of Astronomical Dictionary, but I would like to discuss the various uses of the term and especially give you some understanding of how all of these stars on your images can look like this instead of this by paying attention to back focus. So let's first focus on how a telescope, well, you know, focuses. Here is the optical configuration of various types of telescopes. They all start with a wide aperture and then bend the light to a crossing point. That converging light is brighter than it was at the aperture. And no matter what type of telescope we have, we have some converging light. That's what focus is. But let's get rid of the eyepiece. For a sensor, the critical issue is whether the sensor is in front of the tip of the triangle or behind the tip of the triangle or right smack on the tip of the triangle. Move the sensor back and forth and you move the image in and out of focus. But what about back focus? Here we come to one definition of back focus, the distance from the end of the telescope to the camera. Uh, while that sounds simple, you have to ask, where is the end of the telescopes? For a refractor, it is generally considered the end of the focuser tube. For schmidt cassis it's the end of the main tube. This is an important idea for helping you determine just how much stuff you can put in the imaging train. These are all imaging trains. Some extent for just a few millimeters past the end of this telescope or the draw tube. Others go on for nearly a third of a meter. And good Lord, I don't know what kind of images this one would be taking. But the point here is that you have to have enough room so that all that stuff that you want to stick on the back of your tube and still be able to get the sensor to the focal plane. So if you're putting in 175 millimeters of flatteners, off-axis skiders, auxiliary focusers, and whatnot, be sure that you find a telescope that has 175 millimeters of that kind of back focus. I've heard some people call how far they can move the camera by using the focuser back focus. I'm not one that would call that concept back focus, but I would like to talk instead about focuser travel. It's how far one can move the focuser altogether. How far can you move the focuser back and forth? Assuming you can fit everything you need on the focuser tube, you don't need a lot of focuser travel on an imaging scope. After all, the difference between in focus and out of focus is really not that far. However, since you may be changing the filters, focus wheels, or filter wheels, um, various secondary optics on the back of your telescope tube, it's nice to have lots of room back there. One way you can get more room and be flexible about how you're doing it is to have good focuser travel. But as I said, I don't think I would confuse that with the term back focus itself. Earlier we used this illustration, but you know, it's not quite accurate. We have a big aperture and the rays of light bending in to form their triangle at a focal point. But you notice we have only two rays here. In fact, there are almost infinitely many. So let's say we've got a image out in space that looks something like this. The magenta rays will be coming straight on through pretty much, get bent a little bit, but they still remain in the middle of the picture. Whereas the cyan up atop will be hitting the aperture at various places, get bent appropriately so that they wind up at the bottom and the yellow will wind up at the top. So we have a focal plane with an almost infinite number of rays intersecting at various points on that plane. Now, it isn't even quite this simple, you know, it gets a little more complicated because each of these little rays here, um, that's, life is not perfect. This is what happens with one limitation of our optics called spherical aberration. The rays of light do not actually meet at a single point, but over an area of point. The results are is that stars are bigger than they should be. Another imperfection is called coma, and it's particularly a problem in fast Newtonians. The stars appear to be a little bit off center. 
they look like this instead of what they should look like. And one of the most frequent with almost any optic is the fact that optics generally have a curved field. It's curved here. This field curv curvature can be a problem with visual astronomy, but it's not a killer in visual since our eyes have small entry lenses and our brain optical system works together to make it so that we don't have, notice the problems. But with imaging, it does cause a problem. You see, imaging devices have flat fields. The chips in our cameras are flat, while telescope optics naturally delivered a curved field. So we need something that converts and flattens this curved field. And we call it, sensibly enough, a field flattener. But it's not just optical aberrations that get corrected. There's another thing we may want to do with our objects. Suppose we want to change the focal length of our telescope, particularly in a very long F10 Schmitz cathogram. We want to change the way the light is converging and instead of letting it converge all the way back here like it normally would, we want it to converge a little bit closer. This makes for a wider field of view on our sensor, and this brightness of the pictures it brightens the picture somewhat, allowing us to grab the exposures with less exposure time, and it allows us to see more on the chip. To this end, opticians supply us with field flatteners, coma correctors, reducers, and in some cases, they design several functions into the same optic, so we get flatteners reducers. In doing so, they have to assume certain parameters and require that the user implement these standards. One of those parameters that many people, many devices require a specific distance between the end of the device and the sensor itself. Now, not all secondary optics like these have specific distance requirements. Some will work the same no matter what the distance. Others will continue to work but deliver different results. Some focal reducers, for instance, will work at a variety of back focus distances, but the amount of your reduction you get depends on how far the main sensor is from the reducer. Now this, folks, what I'm talking about now is what I would consider back focus distance. It's the concept that most of us spend so much of our time talking about. It's the specific number of millimeters between the effective end of the last optic and the sensor itself. It's an optical consideration. Oh, and remember, although we think of the corrector or flattener or whatever as the last optical element, in fact, there is often one other element between it and the sensor, a filter. A filter passes light through a piece of glass and you can see how the rules are temporarily altered. Light is converging, but then it straightens out for a bit and then continues to converge. And you'll notice that in that time of straightening out, it winds up behind where the focal point would have been had there been no piece of glass there. So you have to correct the stated back focus requirement of your corrector or your um, to uh, of your corrector to adjust for the presence of this little piece of glass. Now it's not much but it is something to consider. When you insert a filter, increase your specified back focus by one third of the thickness of the glass in the filter. Also, remember that the filter holder itself may or may not add mechanical distance in the optic. Before looking at the um, how to get the spacing just right, let's look at one other device that we may be putting in our imaging train, a off-axis guider. The off-axis guider puts the guide chip in a relationship to the main sensor such that when you move the focus of the main sensor, you're also moving the focus on the guide chip so they stay in focus together. In order to do that, the optic, the main optic here to the prism to the guide chip has to equal the main optic to the sensor position. And the only way you can get that to happen is if the distance from here, the sensor, to the prism face is exactly the same as from the prism, prism face to the guide chip. So those are the two that have to be matched in order to get that focusing right. Now, it's true that uh, you do have some flexibility because up here you can move your camera up and down, focusing, as it were, 
changing this distance. So once you've set this distance approximately right, you can move your other camera, you can move your guide chip camera up and down just a little bit. But beware. A lot of people think that, well, you can just drop the prism down, up and down. But no, that dropping the prism up and down does not usually change the distance from the prism to the guide chip. And it doesn't change the distance from the prism to the main sensor. So you're not changing anything there. Now, there are some off-axis guiders that are made that when you change the depth of the prism, you are also changing the focus position of the camera of the guide camera. So be aware of that, but generally that's not an issue. One other thing you have to remember is that this is a mechanical requirement as opposed to what we are calling the optical requirement of the corrector or, or reducing optic. Furthermore, you can use the thickness of your off-axis guider as part of the mechanical backspacing for correcting the optical backspacing. Your prism, uh, your pickoff prism, uh, does not really affect your corrector or reducer's back poster, for back focus spacing, except that the housing of the off-axis guider may move the sensor backward or forward in the imaging train. Now, I just made the distinction between mechanical back focus requirements of the off-axis guider and the optical background requir requirement of the correcting add-on optic. They both have their own back focus requirements. I've seen some posts where Cloudy Nighters ask how will they reconcile the different back focus requirements. This represents a fundamental misunderstanding. There is no need to add the back focuses together or convolve one with the other. The light waves from the reducer, for instance, do not care whether they are passing through an off-axis guider or a hollow tube. This means that the primary concern when figuring backspacing is getting the optical back focus right. And using the mechanical back focus of the off-axis guider or anything else that's in the imaging train um, is just fine. That's one of the things you could do to help get those, that spacing correct. First thing to do is to determine the precise, precise distance you need. You get that from the specifications of the uh, additional optic. This will usually be expressed in something like you know, 55 millimeter plus or minus one millimeter or something like that. And don't forget to adjust for the filter if you may be inserting. And remember, not all optics have specific requirements. A second point is uh, what you need to do is um, you need to figure out where the distance is measured. Is it measured right here at the top of the threads, at the bottom of the threads, or is it measured from an optic inside? If you're talking about a camera, where is it measured? Where is the sensor on the camera? You have to place all of these things into recognition and you, you have to figure all of these things out. The sensor is not at the front of most cameras. It's in fact recesses. If you can't get an illustration of just where it is or specification, you must measure it. You may find out that sometimes they just Sometimes they count the threads and sometimes they don't count the threads. Sometimes it's best to just get your calipers out and confirm everything is going as you think it should be. Measure it very carefully, however, you don't want to be scratching a sensor or an optic. Now you know just how far you need to be from the front of the camera. You have to figure out how you can get there. What can you put between the optic and the camera to fill the gap between the optic and the sensor? Well, there are some things you will need. A filter wheel, perhaps. This has a specific mechanical distance. Perhaps that off-axis guider we talked about. And then just empty rings of the right distance to make it all work together. And finally, some very small spacers that will adjust the last few parts of a millimeter. Remember, the important part of is the correcting add-on optic. The Altair 8.8 reducer on Domsel's rig and the Skywatcher field flattener on the rig at the Chamberlain Observatory. These are the ones that need to have the correct optical back focus to the sensors to do their proper optical job. Measuring how much each of these devices are physically taking and then add spacers or move items until you have the spacing right between the end of the optic and the main camera sensor. Now, after you've added your filter wheels off axis guiders and all that, you'll need to add a bit more space. 
you may need to add a bit more space. You can find spacers on various places on the web, including very thin Delrin washers, which are just part of a millimeter to get things precisely right. Sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. In particular, spacers do not necessarily actually space the way they seem, since they may be measured differently than you thought. It goes back to the old problem of figuring out where you measure from and where you measure to. Sometimes it's best to screw it all together and measure the overall effect of your various devices. Sometimes you cannot get the spacing just right unless you reorder your imaging train. Perhaps putting your off-axis scatter before the correcting optic may be a solution. Oh, by the way, these parts really like each other. They fall in love and they get married and they stay together for life. All very romantic and encouraging for us humans but it's kind of sucky for stupid astronomy parts that may need to be changed from time to time, even after their first assembly. So adjustment can be difficult after a time. I know of no solutions, but I've tried nose oil. Yeah, the little, oh, you rub your nose and you'll find out it's got a little bit of nose oil on it. Trumpeters apparently find that quite useful. There are rubber grips and filter wrenches. None of them work satisfactorily to my taste. Finally, how do you know you've got it right? If you're talking about a field flattener, take a picture, stretch and enlarge it, and look in the corners. Compare the images of the stars in your corners with these two illustrations, which are available all over the web. If your stars are, as in the illustration here, elongated tangentially, your optic and sensors are too far apart. If they're uh, elongated radially, they're too close together. Make your test adjustments by removing or adding spacers. A slight tweak can be made by temporarily unscrewing a filter one turn. When your image looks good, finalize it by inserting or removing sub-millimeter Delrin spaces as necessary so that you have a firm connection in the imaging train. One usually has at least a millimeter of leeway before things become noticeable. Back focus is important. Unfortunately, the term is used in so many ways that it's hard to pursue proper back focus unless you have a bit of its knowledge of its inner workings. The most critical element for a sharp picture is getting the spacing between the last optic and the sensor correct. Of course, you need proper combination of focuser travel and focuser position so that you can get all the devices like the off-axis guider and the filter wheel attached. The important thing is to think about how all these things interact to get the sensor just where it belongs in relation to the primary optic. And remember, above all, you're not worried about the proper definition of the word back focus. You are now aware of what the term means in different contexts. It means different things. All you need to worry about is making sure that the spacing between your optics and the mechanics is just right no matter what they call it and how they define the words. Now that you've heard what makes sense, just go on out and use your own common sense.